Hey there, listeners, and welcome to episode 101 for the National Land Realty Podcast, where we talk about all things land. Our goal here is to inform, educate, and entertain those of you who own land or are interested in the buying and selling of land throughout the United States. My name is Mac Christian, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at National Land Realty. I will be your host here again for the 101st time. Uh, Today is a really cool episode. We're talking to Crockett Carruthers. Uh, Crockett is the host of the Wealthy Cowboy podcast. And if you look online, if you look anywhere, Crockett is all over the place. Uh, He's been doing guest podcasts with other podcasts as well as his own podcast, focusing on wealth generation for, and as he says it, for cowboys or just blue collar workers or people looking to make their way or looking to find unique ways to build wealth within within the realm of agriculture, ranching, or just blue collar labor. Uh, those of you who are looking to educate yourselves on, on devices like insurance or investments or alternative investments, or even diversification of career fields. This is a very, very cool podcast. This is one that has something for everybody. So stay tuned, enjoy, and I'll talk to you later. Okay, so I am sitting here with Crockett Carruthers, and not to be confused with Shade Carruthers, I think is the name that's showing up on your thing. That's, that's not. Yeah, we're, we're we're here with Crockett, and uh, you're the owner of, owner of Diversified Payments. You're the host of the Wealthy Cowboy, and if you just look up this man's name, you are going to find this person all over social media, YouTube, doing uh doing presentations on investment and wealth management. Uh, as it relates to, I mean, it says it in it on its own, right? The wealthy cowboy. You focus mm-hmm. on blue collar work and how to make a living and how to do things right. And so, I, I want to give you a chance. How did you end up where you are now, doing what you do now, and and you know what what brought you to here? Yeah, so I grew up um, j- just basically ranching and rodeoing. I went to college for animal production. Uh, just been interested in that my whole life. And uh, I realized when it came time to settle down and 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 get married and and we're having a kid and all that stuff, uh, I was just working my ass off and long hours and and not getting paid a whole lot, you know. And so I, I was started searching for something else. I started listening to these podcasts, which led me down a whole road. It started out with just cowboy podcast and. Um, I started listening to some business ones. Uh, Bradley and Dropping Bombs was the first one. I was like, man, this guy kind of looks cool. I'll see what he's got. And um, basically, he just has different business owners on all walks of life, all entrepreneurs in some kind of industry. Uh, so I, I was like, oh, this is cool to listen to the stories, but I never thought I'd be doing anything. Um but when I decided that I was like, man, I want to do, I want to increase my income somehow. Uh, he actually started some companies. The first one he started was real financial, which was life insurance. Uh, like I said, I followed him, listened to all his content, uh, read his book, all that stuff. So I was like, I'll join in with that. Um, so I joined that, learned the life insurance deal, uh, sold life insurance for a little while through real financial. I still have my license, but I don't actively sell. Um, it is a very important product. That's another thing. Like I, I've, I've always sold stuff. Uh, it's always been just stuff I was using. I've sold, I've sold cattle. I've sold, we're always selling some horses. We sell, sell pickup and pickups and trailers. Um, usually any kind of feed or hay we get in that we're feeding, uh, I'll try to sell it just to cheapen my stuff up, right? Um, so I was always in sales, but I never really realized it. Um, but I've always believed in everything that I sold. The life insurance, I, I got to reading up on that. I was like, man, that's you know that's something very important that somebody needs. Uh, so the first policy I wrote was on myself because I think you need to believe in whatever you're selling and back that product up. So... I, I went through that for about a year, year and a half. It's probably been two years now. Um, that model was, it can be a great model, but I would just was not putting in the work that it took. Um, he also started a, another 
company called Real Merchant Services, where I learned the merchant services business, which is mainly credit card processing. So anytime you swipe a credit card at a store, at a gas pump, uh, over the run it over the phone, anytime you run a credit card or a debit card, somebody's on the back end of that, getting the money from one place to the other. And uh, somebody's making a little bit of money off of that. So it's it's a really great industry. It's got recurring revenue. Um, so once you get that built up, you know, it's, it keeps coming in monthly. So I really like that model. Uh, went through the training with, with them, with real, but it was all virtual. It was all based in Las Vegas. So there was kind of a disconnect for me. I didn't do a, do much with it for a while and a mutual or a, a buddy of mine had a, had another guy that he had been working for. Um, he actually owns diversified payments I, and I work for them. But uh, it's it's right down the road. It's in Heiko, Texas, about an hour from me. Um, little, little office there, and he said, "You know, come up. Yeah, we'll talk about it." Uh, it was it's been really great. That guy John Keeley is is the owner, one of the owners of Diversified Payments, and he is super knowledgeable. Uh, I had a podcast with him on the Wealthy Cowboy Show, and it, it's crazy. I, I've always I always love sitting down with him and picking his brain. He's always got great stories, very knowledgeable, been in different industries and uh, and been very successful, lost. I mean, just lost it all, built it all back up. And it, it's crazy. But um, yeah, it's been I've been with them for about a year and it's been pretty awesome. Like I said, it's recurring revenue. So I'm building that all the time. And it's it's great that we can help um, help businesses save money. I mean, we we helped the local feed store. They were one of my first customers. They saved about twenty thousand a year in in credit card processing fees. So it's it's cool to be able to help businesses like that. Um, I started out with you know my friends' businesses, everybody I know. I was reaching out to them, helping them, you know, if I could, uh, which most of the time we can. There's just it's an unregulated industry, so these companies can, can kind of do whatever they want. They're, they're tacking on fees, uh, you know, maybe get you in with a promotion or something and then, and then ramp it up kind of like, you know, a, a phone company or a, a cable company might do. They think, you know, they're not looking at it anymore. We're just going to start adding some extra fees in there and raising that rate up. So it's been real cool. Um, built a little bit of business out of that. And then, so in this journey, um, I'm always, listening to podcasts, reading books, listening to books on Audible, uh, and just consuming as much stuff as I can, learning as much as I can, mainly about business. But I also still cowboy a little bit um, with my own operation and then for other people day working. So I'm still ate up with that bug and and do it as much as I can. Uh, so I still, I still love you know, listening to old cowboy stories and and podcasts like uh, the Flatbed Podcast and and the Gauge and Cow Horse Full Contact. You know, just the cowboy stuff. So I was really hoping that somebody would come out with a podcast or something like that that would that would kind of combine business and and cowboys and the cowboy culture. Um, nothing ever happened, and really those the other ones that I listened. To, do they don't put out a whole lot anymore or some of them at all uh so i've kind of just got to where like when i get something in my mind i'm gonna do it um i'll go you know i try to pay somebody or get somebody to help me but regardless if i, I if i can't get it done I, i'm gonna just go i'm just gonna dive into it so i found a place to do a podcast and i was like I'm just going to start it and see where it goes. I think we're 20 something episodes in now. Uh, it's been pretty great. It's, it's uh, growing all the time. I'm getting to meet a lot of new people from it. Uh, get a lot of people messaging me and stuff and saying how much they like it, how much it helps them. And uh, really that's what I tried to do was, was merge business and merge uh, Western culture. So uh, I have ranch guys on, I had rodeo guys, I have real estate people, 
business, different business people. Um, everybody is connected to the Western culture somehow, whether it's ranching or rodeo or they own horses or whatever it is. And then they're also connected to business and had some success somewhere in that or social media, something. And uh, I try to bring people on and I try to, no matter the, who it is, I want some, I want everybody to listen to every episode. Cause I try to try to get something out of every episode. Somebody can learn something from where it's a, you know, some kind of habit that somebody does or some kind of new industry that somebody doesn't know about or a new way of, of doing things. I try to really open everybody, everybody's eyes up and, um, and really myself also, I'm there to learn from those people. So it's, it's really been awesome. I'm sure you get, you get to, you get to do that too in this. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Uh, so, so tell me <laughs> how, how can people listening right now find your podcast? So we're on YouTube, Apple and Spotify. Perfect. And, and um, you can, you can find the, if you look me up on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, I'm always posting, um, posting clips from it, you know, trying to promote it. Uh, and I post the links to every everywhere whenever it comes out. So, but it's just the wealthy cowboy show. You can look it up on any platform. Excellent, and I and I have. It's a good show. Uh, <laughs> so I want to detour a little bit off topic. You got onto this mm -hmm. show because I, I mentioned I was going to do this. I have to do it. Uh, yeah. So how did you arrive on this show? Who approached you? So we uh, we were at a rodeo, a ranch rodeo in Fort Worth, and. Um, it's crazy uh, now since the show come out and and, um, and I put so much content out, I get people coming up to me all the time, you know, saying they like it, introducing themselves and 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 all that stuff. And um, I had a guy come up to me and and he introduced himself first and we talked. And then after the rodeo, he said, hey, my wife uh, does marketing for a podcast and a company that, that has a podcast. And would you be willing to come on? Uh, I said, sure. Uh, he said it was more real estate based. I said, I'm not, you know, I don't know what I can provide, but I'll definitely come on. And uh, so here we are. <laughs> this is this is the husband of our director of marketing, Kelly Balderrama. <laughs> it's Matthew. And it, it just it fits so well with what I know. Of. I've met him in person once. And it was our national conference. And I, lo I love telling this story because it's just awesome. So he he came with his wife to our national conference and he comes walking up and he just kind of just looks me in the eyes and he steps up real close. And he's like, my name is Matthew and you know, I'm Kelly, it's Kelly's husband. It's like, oh, it's nice to meet you. You know, and I'm kind of expecting because, you know, I'm Kelly's boss that, it, that it's going to be sort of a hello, sir. It's great to meet you. And, you know, like the, the, the usual kind of thing. And he just looks at me for a long time and he puts out his hand. And he's like, I just want to know what kind of man you are. And, <laughs> and it was it was it took me so off guard because it was so fun. But it was like I gained so much respect on the spot. It was like that was awesome. Like, yes. OK, yeah, I'm a hundred. Whatever you want to know. Let's talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now he's gotten us a podcast guest. He doesn't even know that he's working for us now. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's just out there promoting and yeah you must have made a good impression i maybe i don't know maybe <laughs> so no he's an awesome awesome guy but i love the fact that i get to talk about it he's going to hear this eventually um so that yeah. just makes my day uh so okay so i want to sort of just ask you overhead you know you do a lot of education for and, and you're you're saying western culture it's going to be cowboy culture it's going to be agriculture mm -hmm. it's you know blue collar culture um what what is it that you try to teach and what do you want people to get out of it so um you know you're you're best you're best able to serve who you used to be so um who i used to be was just a i was a day working cowboy that just that just worked didn't know anything besides uh making money from my labor um and when I started listening to this other stuff, consuming this education, I've I've gone through courses and read books. And like I said, I'm always trying to learn something every day. And what I've realized is the people that make the most money aren't trading their time for money. And they're they're definitely not trading their labor for money. Um, and there's there's ways that anybody can do it. Uh, 
so I just want to bring that to light and and show people that hey, you know, taking a ranch job for two thousand dollars a month and working seven days a week, twelve hours a day, or fourteen hours a day, you don't have to do that. Sure, it can if if that's all you want to do. If that's all you want to do is live on a ranch, you know, you do that. I, I love the ranch life. I, I want to bring my my kids up up that way and and live the ranch life. But I also like to have nicer things in life and want to own my own stuff. Um, when you get tied down in those jobs like that, they really handcuff you. Um, they they usually give you pickup trailer, house, beef, all that stuff. Well, when a guy gets fired or or leaves or whatever, they usually don't have anything. They're they're having to go to another place, you know, that provides a house because they don't have anywhere to go. Like I said, I'm not putting anybody down that wants to do that, but it wasn't for me. Um, and I just thought that maybe there might be some other people out there like that, uh, whether you're younger than me or my age or, or even older people that just never have heard of it. I want to bring that mainstream, the mainstream business stuff, ideas about money and all that and and financial planning and how people run businesses into our our cowboy culture uh i say western culture to leave it very broad um but cow cowboy culture is what i'm most connected to uh like i said that's that's what i did for a living i, I cowboyed for a living and still do a lot um so i just want to bring those mainstream messages into a and package it to where a guy on a ranch or a guy going to a rodeo will will listen to that and maybe take something from it because you know we're just we're just not exposed to it in our in our industry in our in our culture we're always way behind on trends on marketing on sales on how to run a business any of that we're we're in our own little subculture which is cool cool in some ways and it also keeps us behind the time in some way so uh I take I try to take a lot of that mainstream stuff and just repackage it and and put it out into into our culture. You bring up a really good point with with you know you you brought up ranch life and and people that jump into it and you know that's usually it starts out as a young man's game right like like coming out and and either being involved with family ranch or just working around a ranching family or just maybe have a passion for it start working for a ranch and then, you know, there, there's that next step career wise that that's there. But a lot of people don't know what it is or where it is. And, and you know, the the thing that I immediately thought of is because because I know several that you work for a long time doing the ranch thing. And you're right. They, they get stuff provided for them. And it's usually like from what I've seen, it's it's injury, like body wear down, like like you're not mm -hmm. able to do it anymore. And then then what do you have? Like, what's your resume? It's not like the family is just going to pay your medical bills for the rest of your life or the, or the ranch that you work for is going to pay your medical bills. And then it's what's next. Cause then it's like, uh Oh, and, and to where you're sort of providing that next step information. Um, so what's the, what, what's the number one roadblock that you find? And, and again, like I take the same stance. It's not, it's not a negative. I'm not, I don't want to talk negative about that work. Like, if it's in you, you got to do it. And, but mm -hmm. there's also like your, your career progression, just like anybody, I started out, you know, low level marketing paperwork stuff and, and, and doing the thing and running the hustle and, and then had to bounce somewhere else eventually. So everybody has a career progression that they go through. What do you see as the biggest roadblock that, that, that people think about that says like, Oh, I, I just do this and I don't know what to do next. Right. Uh, I, I think that a lot of it is just is just lack of education. Um, and especially like you, you can't blame somebody for that. Like it, if you are working seven days a week in long hours, there's you're not you don't have time to think about other <laughs> right. things and go and, you know, and read, read books and and take courses and listen to podcasts all the time. Uh, one thing that I was fortunate of, I was driving a lot. so. That's I always listen to podcasts driving, um, but I think a big part of it is lack of education. And then, and then, if it's not that, once you start getting it, I see a lot. Also, is 
uh, people will get the education and then just sit on it and never take action. Um, and I just, I just learned at, at some point in the last few years that, like I said, when I get something in my head, we're going to do it. Um, uh, whether it's wrong or right or indifferent, we're going to have a result out of it. And, and if it's a failure, then at least we know, and we can either build off of that and, and keep going and do it better or, or just say, Hey, that was a bad idea and go a different direction. Uh, like when I started, when I, I would, like I said, I was working a lot. And then when we had Lottie, my daughter, I, I quit all my jobs that I had, my main jobs that I had working at the cell barns. So my income basically went to zero. And I was like, I'm going to figure this sales deal out. I'm going to figure out a different way to make money. And um, so that's most people definitely not do that. And I, I don't encourage anybody to do that. But uh, that's what I did. I knew that if I just kept kept stringing along, you know, I just keep putting it off. Uh, so I gave me gave myself that deadline that I was just going to take the jump. And I think a lot of people are just scared to take the jump. Uh, that's another thing about myself is like, I just know that I, I've I've got to go do it. I've, I know there's potential. If I know there's pot potential somewhere, you know, I'm going to take that leap, whether it's walking up and talking to somebody new or, you know, going in like sales is hard. Like you're, you're going to get a lot of rejection, rejection. So that's, that's something to learn. Um, but you just got to get, you just got to get out there and do it. Just take action. Um, so I'd say a lot of people just lack the education. They just never get taught a different way. The The deal is, you know, just go to school, go to college, get a job, you know, retire. But that doesn't work anymore unless you can go get a high paying job and then and set something aside for retirement. But most people's 401k is a million dollars anymore. I mean, you retire at 65. You can't live off that million, the interest on that million dollars for the rest of your life. And um, I just think a lot of things have changed. And um, I don't know if if I'm in an echo chamber all the time, I listen to that stuff all the time, or if it's getting more mainstream, everybody's kind of seeing it. College isn't what it used to be. Uh, a lot of people that I know of coming out of college are looking at trades or doing something different. So I'm hoping that the education part's, uh, you know, kind of catching up. Um, and which I'm trying to provide that also be a part of that movement. And then the other thing is, man, you just got to go do it. You got to take action. You just spoke to something. We just did our, our hundredth episode for our podcast and we had numerous guests on there. And these are all people that started their careers running uh, a hunt guiding business or, or create in this case, creating a hunting Island. And it was a destination hunt or uh, somebody who created a, a, a software app um uh quest hunt is what it's called the, the the gentleman that created that is brian austin and it's a it's a gamified hunting system where you hunt as partners and you know it's minimal cost for huge rewards and it 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 turns the hunt into a game system against all the other hunters in your state um and and then and then a real estate uh managing broker in nebraska that that created you know he's one of the highest grossing real estate agents in land now and and so we had all those individuals and, and another guest was somebody who worked with a turkey conservation and and every single one of them echoed the same point that you just gave, which is they decided to go for it and they gave themselves no other options. And it's 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 it's, this, it's really unique. It's it's something that I don't I don't know if I've ever heard so consistently is and it, and it has to do with it's that whole outdoors field land ranching agriculture it's like i've decided to do this and that there's no other option is and mm -hmm. so you just find a way to do it um so so now that you're kind of doing your thing um what are what are the i guess the the low-hanging fruit like what what do people need to consider if they are working in a position like let's take i, I think the, the easiest thing to talk about is somebody who is uh you know ranch hand uh working helping out with ag um where they they're sort of contemplating what do i do next and how can i how can i build wealth what are some of the i know that you probably have bullet points that you teach across the board 
Um, so what are some of the things that you discussed that are, that are, that are, cause I, and I, I'm, I'm kind of bouncing around this a little bit because I know that everybody's situation is different, but I, I know that there's some commonality in there. And I, so what, what is it that you kind of engage with, with people to teach them on that level? Like, what do you need to get together? Um, yeah, it's, everybody's different. Um, but I would say one thing that holds people back is them thinking that they can't do something. Uh, I never would have thought I would have got into sales or been on a podcast or got into marketing, found a passion for that. You know, I was just a ranch cowboy or a rodeo cowboy and then a ranch cowboy. And now I've progressed, but like the, the limiting beliefs holding people back that they, that they can't do something. Um, I think a lot of guys, I struggled with it for a long time, giving up that identity of what will people think of me um, if I'm not just a ranch cowboy and I do start doing other things, you know, uh, you know, I thought, you know, people might think of me as a sellout or something, but at some point it's like, who cares what they think? <laughs> I've got to do it for me. Um, so yeah, that limiting belief, uh, if if you see somebody else do it, you can do it also. Um, it may be, take you a little bit longer or whatever, but I just tell people keep their eyes out. If they're wanting to, if they're wanting to increase their income, keep their eyes out, start listening to podcasts, start talking to people that, that have been successful. Um, of course, like a, a ranch guy, our, our whole deal was, you know, to have our own ranch at some point. And it's harder and harder with land cost and, and leases are hard to find. Um, uh, and also the margins are small. It's, it's pretty good right now, but, uh, it costs a lot of money to get in. I'm not saying you can't do it, but nowadays I think you got to think outside the box and get creative, uh, to do it ranching. Um, you know, I've, I've tried just about every little niche that I can find, uh, making, making some money in the, in the agriculture and ranching, uh, from sheep and goats, heifers, calves, cows, kind of doing whatever. So you can, if you can get some land or a little operation, you know, don't just say I'm going to do it this way, you know, get creative, see what works best for you and your setup and will make you the most money. Um, and then yes, sales was, is huge. Like, Brad Lee says that all the time. Like, if you're going to get rich, if you're going to make a lot of money, you're going to have to sell something. Um, and I tell people that don't want to leave ag. I mean, you don't have to go sell life insurance or, you know, credit card processing or anything like that. You can get into to real estate. You can, you know, sell land, uh, sell ranches, sell horse properties. Uh, you can become a mortgage broker um, and help help people get those houses and those ranches and those horse properties. Uh, you can set, there's medicine reps, you know, cattle medicine reps, there's feed reps, any of that stuff. Um, but I would look at the, I would look at something like that, see what kind of sparks your interest and then go find somebody that's done it and pick their brain. And maybe it's something you want to pursue. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a network marketing MLM deal, you know, something like that. Those are really great for entry level. Uh, they have they come with a lot of training on sales and will kind of get you out of your shell. And then maybe you want to go on to something else. But a lot of people made money on that deal. I just look. I, I want to look when I look at an industry. When I looked at credit card processing, I looked at you know I want to look at somebody that's been doing it a while and and pick their brain on how much can I make. What's what's the long term look like. Probably anything you do, you're going to suck at first just because you're not going to know it. Um, changing industries, even if you've been in sales before, you're selling something new. For me, I, I was not in, not good at sales, not good at talking, you know, introverted, shy. Uh, so that was a whole skill I had to learn. And uh, I'm always trying to improve on. But but just realize that you're probably going to suck no matter what you do. Um, but I just. I tell everybody to just keep their eyes open and just look for opportunities. Um, I know it's real controversial, but uh, I listened to a lot of Andrew Tate's stuff. And, and one thing he said was like, if you go in and buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks or go into a restaurant or a coffee shop, whatever, 
buy buy a cup of coffee or buy some food, think of how that place is making money, how they got your money from you, how they drew you in, how much they're making, how you could get something like that and improve it. And you just start, if you start thinking about that stuff all the time, the opportunity will arise, you know, um, what, and whatever that is, if, if you're always thinking about it. And another thing that I struggled with at first was the shiny object syndrome. Um, you know, it was oh, everybody's once you get into it, they start marketing to you. Uh, you'll start getting fed those ads on Facebook and stuff. You know, come over here, you make all this money or do this deal, buy this thing, you make all this money. You really need to try to find something to focus on. Uh, I try to do like at least a year and then see where you're at in a year and then, you know, reevaluate if you're not having success, maybe uh, either ch change something up or or go a different route. I like that you use shiny object syndrome in that man, like that's the I use that phrase probably daily. Um, and it's, you know, managing for a company with 400 and some agents nationwide. Uh, just in my role alone, I get probably five emails a day from different solicitors trying to sell shiny things. But what's funny is, you know, the agents in the field that we have you know, they're, they're buried in working with land, like they work with land and they work with clients. And so when they get communications like that, you know, they'll, they'll, they bring stuff to me a lot. It is like, Hey, this thing came to me, check this out. And it's like, it's the next shiny thing. And it's, it's, I, I'm not bagging on them bringing it to me. They're enthusiastic about what they do and they, and they don't see it. And they honestly, they don't get beat to death like I do with other advertisements. Yeah. And so when they get something, they're bringing it to me. It's like, you know, we'll we'll make your social media post for you we'll do this for you and it's like okay but what's the catch and then there's always a catch to it and it's always shiny and it's it's just some variant to the thing and it's easy to do that and if you get and, and you know i've seen it before with with other other companies is that you get caught up in shiny object syndrome and then you don't make money because you're spending it on a lot mm -hmm. of other things that didn't actually make things easier and and i i guess the, the biggest thing to consider in that case, especially starting out, is you're, the biggest watchdog you have to have is cash flow, right? Like how much is going in, how much is you know coming out. Um, and that's like it, for any kind of career change, you got to watch that cash flow like a hawk. Like don't buy anything. Don't do any. Like just watch it. Yeah. It's, yeah. And that's that's the cool thing about like getting in, uh, getting into a service industry. Um, it seems like a lot a lot of guys, you know. Uh, that live on a ranch, you know, can do about anything. They can plumb and weld and build fence and all that. So the obvious progression is to go start your own fencing company or metal building company or whatever. And people can make a lot of money doing that, but dang, you, you got to buy all that equipment and put a lot of money up to get started. If you get into, if you can get into some kind of sales uh, in a service industry, or uh, MLM or or something like that. I mean, most of those you can get in for little to nothing. If you get with the right um, companies, like, I don't know how it is with real estate, but like insurance, but like they paid for me to take my course and, and help me get my license. Like they'll help, they'll help bring you in. So it was, it's very little out of pocket. And then once you're in something, you know, then it's kind of up to you to do if you're going to go buy leads, if you're going to create your own leads, if you're if you're just going to get out there and door knock. I mean, it's it's all just sweat equity. It's uh, you getting on the phone, you getting, you know, reaching out, whatever it is. Uh, but then, like you said, you always get the the people saying, hey, we can we can get you appointments in your calendar for thousand dollars a month or, you know, whatever it is or these more high quality leads. And I just, I realized the hard way that really like anybody that's built anything just did it through hard work. You know, just, they just embrace the suck and they're, they, nobody likes cold calling people. Nobody likes getting cold, cold calls or telemarketers, but that's how most businesses were built. Most successful sales agents in any industry that I've found, you know, that's what they did. They did cold reach out. They were they were going and do knocking on doors, talking to people, even though you might suck at it at first and it's uncomfortable and nobody likes doing it. But uh, that that CRM that's automated and all this stuff, it's nice. But most people 
started out doing all the hard stuff and then you can start streamlining it to buy back your time. Yeah. And that's, I, so I myself have been, I've been series seven licensed and series 66 licensed doing finance. And, uh, I spent a couple of years doing that and it's, you're exactly right. You have to embrace the awfulness of hopping on the phone and getting yelled at daily all day. And it's, yeah. you know, I, I, I've been there myself and, and to, to your point though, you decide to go through it and, and it's, they are soft hands industries, right? Like if you're going to do something like that, cause when somebody is, is working in, in a ranch or, or, or any kind of, any kind of labor intensive thing, the easiest progression is like going into fencing, going into welding. And then it, to, to your point also like, well, do you have a welder? Do you have the goods? Do you have the environment for it? Cause a lot of people do that and they'll run it as a side hustle if they can get the equipment, but the overhead is pretty astronomical a lot of the times. And so service industries are, are an easy jump point. And, you know, all you're lacking is the education at that point. If you're willing to hit the books for, you know, between six and eight months, sometimes four months, like you come out with a license and you're ready to go. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then it's just all on you. And and there's there's a lot of places out there to build leads. Like you said, lead lists are out there. You can purchase those. You can purchase appointment setters or there's I got to bring this one up because it's the most dirtbag thing I've seen in a long time. And I swore that I would take every chance I could to talk about it. There's a local person here. I won't name the name off the bat, but they put out a thing on Facebook saying, hey, who who has who has a great accountant? And so I have an account that uh, that I love. And so I sent the name to him, like expecting like this is a person asking for an accountant to use. I got a call from my accountant like, hey, this guy just solicited me for his services on networking. And I was like, oh, that was so dirty. Like I hit, <laughs> and there's an element like, so it, it, like if you're building the business too, you got to be ethical and you got to do what you say you're going to do. Like it, it, your, your character comes out when you do that, that person, I'm going to disparage if anybody brings his name up for the rest of my life. And, and, <laughs> and it's one of those, like, don't do that. Like, so it's everything from putting forth the effort and then maintaining good character along the way too, because it matters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been listening a lot lately to uh, Myron Golden. He's a he's a sales guy. I think, he, and his deal is he went from trash man to cash man. Uh, he went from barely making it, got into life insurance, didn't make a sale for like two years, but he just stayed with it, just kept doing it, and then finally, you know, it started clicking and started rolling. But he was saying uh, on a video I was watching watching earlier that. Uh, that building your brand this year, how you can build a brand is, is have integrity, just do what you say you're going to do. And that's the best way to build a brand. You know, you start going out and doing that, you start, start doing the things that you say you're going to do and people will start noticing and the word of mouth will travel and, you know, it'll go out through social channels and you're, you can get referrals and all this stuff. But he said that's the best way to build a brand. Just do what you say you're going to do. And the people that don't, you know, that come in, you know, with with the shiny object or whatever, and then they check out, you know, after you hand them some money, then those people, like you said, they're, they're going to have a bad name. They're going to be out of that industry and or out of that town or whatever it is. But the people that build their brand on integrity and do what they say they're going to do, then you know, they're going to, they're the ones that are successful. They're the ones that are going to be around forever and can actually build something no matter what industry it is. Yeah. It's one of those where like, you can get a quick start by doing something shady, but it will catch up. Like people will Mm -hmm. find out or there's backroom chatter or something like that. Like it it, it gives you some jumps in politics and stuff like that. And it might be an immediate gratification thing, but it usually comes back around. Um, So I I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, as far as in, 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 in your own experience and, and you came at it from a life insurance perspective, and that's where I take it as like sort of a planning phase is that as somebody starts, you know, they, they jump out of, of whatever they're into and they, and they go into that, that wealth generation phase of their life. You know, it's usually that secondary to third kind of career move that people make. 
Um, what are some of the the sort of infrastructure things that they should do first? You brought up life insurance, and I think that that's a really good one to bring up. But as far as mm-hmm. things that stabilize their life, and and I don't want to do this, I don't want to put you in a hot spot because you have an insurance license, and I know you can't give specific advice. You got to keep it general. But are there things that people should look at to consider? Yeah. Um, so I was I kind of just sold everything, um, but I really through through podcasts and books and everything I, I learned this infinite banking concept um and i really like it i always when i started learning about life insurance i was like man this whole life deal really sounds like you know the way to go and i started researching it you look at history the wealthiest families in america you know and even before that or use life insurance to pass their wealth on uh so a whole life policy and a term life policy, there's a big debate. You know, Dave Ramsey says buy term, invest the rest. And then you have the, the whole life crowd that says this is the way to build wealth. And like I said, everybody's different, but I always, always lean this way. And I never really understood the whole concept, but you can set up a whole life policy if you get the right one that grows and you're a partner with the insurance company. Um uh, a term policy is the most profitable for an insurance company because they pay out less than 2% of the time. It's, it looks cheaper. If you show it to, you know, if you show it side by side term policy, a million bucks for $80 a month, a whole life policy, you're going to get a hundred thousand for 150 a month or something like that. We're like, Oh no, I'd way rather have this higher coverage, but you're never going to get that. Nobody's ever going to see that. You're just going to waste, you know, most of the time. I'm not completely against it. There's cases where you need to add some term. Uh, You know, if you've got a lot of money out and a lot of debt to cover, maybe you need some term for a certain amount of time, but you're guaranteed to die at some point. So you want that whole life coverage. And the older you get, the more expensive it's going to be. And in that, you can also, there's there's several different ways. If you get the right policy, uh, you you can collect dividends on it. So you're partnered with the insurance company, your part owner. So as they do good, you're going to you're going to grow your policy with those dividends and it's going to grow tax free. And then when you die, it's going to get passed along tax free. So you avoid a lot of taxes there if you store your money in that. And it's also protected against judgment. So when, if you do create a lot of wealth, you know, somebody's probably going to try to come take it from you, uh, you know, if some kind of bad deal or your kid hit somebody on the road or whatever it is, you know, you're probably going to get sued if you've got some money and they can't come after that. Uh, so that, that's the big thing. Um, storing that in life insurance, uh, a lot of wealthy people do it. I know Dave Ramsey went a different route and he's got his own deal. Um, another deal that most people will agree on is real estate, um, going and buying cash flow in real estate is a is a big thing uh i don't have it i mean we just have our own place our own home but it's crazy i can see you know we bought it before prices skyrocketed and and um, got a good interest rate on, on it and stuff so our equity in it has just it's it's crazy it's crazy how much it's gone up so i can see that you know it's a hard asset uh I don't know a whole lot about the stock market, but I know like uh, if you buy a horse or some cows or some land, some real estate, you can go out there and touch that. You know, you have some control over it. Um, But a lot of people, uh, you know, that I follow, Robert Kiyosaki, Grant Cardone, Dave Ramsey, they all have real estate. Uh, So I think that's a great way to store wealth also. And just getting, getting started though is getting something uh, I think that where you're making money, not off your back, you know, uh, cause you can only do that so much. So whether it's learning to sell something or to educate somebody, but it's usually, you know, using your mouth and, uh, and finding a way to make money like that and make money while you sleep. Uh, I think it's, I think it's Clint Anderson. He even talks about it, that he, that somebody told him when he was young that you'll never, you'll never build wealth from from you you have to multiply yourself and that's what he did with his content 
and his videos and putting out education. Uh, he can make money and sell DVDs and 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 sell courses and all this stuff that he does while he sleeps. Um, you can do that in agriculture also with with livestock or with a crop. Um, unfortunately, the margins just aren't near as high. Uh, but you can do it if you can if you can get a hold of, of the land. I mean, that's how you multiply yourself. You plant seeds. Or you grow, you know, you put a cow out there and she she produces a calf or you got a calf out there growing, you know, pounds of beef. You're multiplying yourself that way. But finding a way to make money while you sleep and then putting that money somewhere where it will grow by itself and work for you instead of you having to go take care of it all the time. You were talking about insurance and it, I. I I'm sort of like a poster boy case study for insurance on on that level, like in in terms of providing for families. Um, my father was was killed on a on a plane crash on a business trip, and I was around six years old. And of course, that came with a settlement. And my my mom did a thing that I don't know that a lot of people do is she just set it aside and didn't touch it. It's one of those things where it was like it's supposed to be used to raise you, and like we we were not we were not well off at all. But she had a thing about it that that was for college. And so I ended up going to college for free. And I was I was a moron in high school. I, there was no scholarship for me. And so in order to get me an education, that's that that's what did it. And that's how I got to where I am. She made a choice of sacrifice and and it was built off of this tragedy. But insurance is the one thing that paved it. And, it you know, it was like the eighties when this stuff happened and it was like, nobody was planning that kind of stuff. And it was, I think it was an accident that my dad had life insurance. So it was one of those, like it worked out, but had that not been the case, Oh my gosh, like I, my life would be a different story. And it's one of those, like, I, I, I don't say it very often, but the context is here for this. Um, you know, it, it's a good planning thing to look at, like for people that mm -hmm. in that next step in life, and it's one of those like once you hit 30 and 40, that stuff gets pricey. So it's like when you're young, look at it, get it, get it implemented and then never worry about it again. And, and like yeah. you have that thing taken care of. Um, so you, you also spoke to, uh, you know, looking at looking at educating yourself is is that what you feel is the most powerful piece? Because, I mean, you spoke to you spoke to education on numerous pieces of this conversation about just. Mm -hmm. And it's it's you know education is sort of a blanket term, but it's finding finding information on what you want to do. Is yeah, uh, I'd I'd say education, learn something new every day, is a non negotiable for me. Um, no matter if we're on vacation, I try to I try to exercise every day, but there's instances where I don't get to the gym or or get something done. But every day I'm going to learn something. Most of the time that's through podcasts uh, or audibles. If I go to the gym or if I'm driving, that's what I'm listening to. Uh, I'll keep physical books sometimes and uh, and read those a little bit at a time in the evenings or something. Uh, watching YouTube videos. Uh, but always, always trying to learn something. Uh, like I said, right now, it's uh, it's a lot of business. It's a lot of sales and marketing is what I listen to. I listen to a lot of Alex Ramosi. I like listening to Bradley. Uh, and that's kind of what I base my podcast off of is, is telling people stories and then also trying to provide some opportunity and some education there while they, while they tell their story. Uh, but that's huge education. Um, and I, like I said, I went to college, I went to Tarleton, but I wasn't, I didn't learn a whole lot. Uh, I wasn't wanting to learn. Now I just, I crave it. You know, I'm trying to learn something all the time. Uh, even, and and I look at it at that, through that perspective now, even when we go somewhere in day work or go work cow somewhere, whatever, whatever the situation is, you know, just take it as a learning experience. Even if it sucks, even if you don't like the way you're doing it, you know, or you think you could do it better, just you're, you're learning, like, just take that and say, I, if I have control, we're not going to do it this way anymore. Or, hey, the way this guy did this was really awesome. And it worked really good. 
or we could improve this a little bit if we tweaked it and did this. It's everything's just learning. And if you if you go at it with kind of an open mind and just going to learn, no matter the situation, um, then it's helped me a lot with with just being just being more grateful and having more gratitude and and not being a hothead and being and having a temper and getting down on myself and all that stuff. Just if you go with that open mind and, and you know, that you're going to learn something. But education is huge. Wherever you wherever you get it, I'd, I'd try to learn something every day. Um, and, you know, you can try to learn something completely different. Like if you're going through, uh, if you want to change industries, you know, start start easing off that way or try to better yourself in whatever you're doing. If you want to ranch, then try to try to learn as much as you can in that aspect. Yeah, I like to I like to make the comment that college is not about learning in in and of itself. Like you're not going to you're not going to come out of college with, you know, a business ready to go in your pocket. The mm-hmm. the act of going to college is learning how to learn. And it's yeah. learning that I can find information or that I can write a research project and this is how I would do it. It's uh, I think there's that false expectation of like, oh, college doesn't do anything. Like it's learning how cuz I wasn't I I am not a uh, poster child for for my undergrad grad school. I pulled a four point, but like undergrad is almost an embarrassment because I was just <laughs> it, 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 I think that I had life had to beat me up a little bit before I realized I knew how to learn. And I realized yeah, the yeah. value that that was there. Like, I, I you know, it, it was one of those things. Um, I want to you know, we're running up on time. I want to make sure I give you ample opportunity here. Um, tell us about what you do and how you help companies and exactly what diversified payments does and sort of what what you're doing on a daily basis to help other people mm-hmm. so diversified payments we we help companies with their payment process and basically uh we're a full merchant services company we can help companies get capital in several different ways through cash advances and and credit lines and even loans if that's something they need but our main deal is credit card processing and savings on that area uh our most popular program I'm sure everybody's seen is when you go somewhere now, they charge you a fee to use your card. Uh, that's our most popular program. And I saw it before and it was, it's kind of a shock at first to see that and like, Oh, I wonder why they're doing that, you know, and uh, try to pay cash at those places. And then, you know, end up paying my card. Cause if you look at it, if you're paying a few percent, it's usually a few cents, you know, a dollar or two, you know, depend, as long as it's not a huge amount. If you're going to a restaurant or a feed store or something, you're going to pay a little bit here and there. But if you look at the other side of it, you're paying a few dollars here and there. And the business was having to pay $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month. You know, it really adds up for them. And since COVID and all this stuff, you know, it's it's hard on small businesses. So we try to really help them out with that. We also do uh, traditional processing. It's called Interchange Plus. Uh, if somebody does not want to pass the fee on, we can usually beat their rate that they usually have. Uh, like I said, a lot of these companies, once they get you in, they start raising their rates up and adding some fees here and there and stuff like that. Or holding your funds. I mean, there's a lot of shady stuff that goes on in that industry. Uh, so we really try to help them save money. Uh, like I said, if they need capital, something like that. And then I've I've started incorporating uh, through learning about a lot about digital marketing and social media and stuff like that. I've started incorporating some marketing uh, for my customers uh, when they come on. So I try to really uh, help them. In two of the three aspects, and in my mind, a business, you know, you have your expenses to make more money. You can lower expenses, which we can help with the credit card processing. And then you can do more marketing to drive more traffic to your business. Uh, And then once that traffic gets there, of course, you got to convert it into sales. Uh, So we can cut their fees, you know, save them money on the expenses side. I can do some marketing with them. I do some free marketing for my clients and then offer discounted rates in the future for different aspects through my channels. And then the sales is up to them. I don't, you know, I I can't really help with that in most cases, but uh, I try to help them all around where, you know, 
I want these, I, I like going in and, and visiting with these mom and pop stores and these, you know, family owned stores and, and seeing people my age and young people start, you know, start these businesses or take over these businesses. I like the interaction. Uh, I, I'm not one to sit on Amazon and order stuff or, or go to a huge chain store all the time. Sometimes it's, you have to, but I like going to these small, these small places, these mom and pop, you know, places as you call them. And they're not going to be around if, if somebody doesn't help them. So that's what I really try to do is, is help those kind of places. And, um, and I want to keep them in business, you know, and I, I try to do business with my clients as much as I can also, you know, and reciprocate it all. But that's, that's what we do. And like I said, it's cutting the expenses and then helping them with marketing. Now that I have a following and have a, have a channel to, to do that. I've started offering that service and, um, and probably we'll start doing more of that because I'm trying to I'm trying to grow my channels also. So I'm always I'm always educating myself on social media and how to how to grow and how to reach people and how to be engaging. So I want to pass that knowledge along too. Yeah. And then what's the geography that you're that you work with with diversified payments? Uh so I live in central Texas. Uh, we can kind of go all over. I just talked to a lady in Arizona. Um, we can do it remotely, but I, I, like I said, I like to go in and deal with the people locally and we travel. I mean, a lot, we're going to rodeos and working and family in the panhandle in Oklahoma. So we're traveling all over. I try to go, uh, if it's in driving distance, I try to go drive to that business and meet everybody in person and and set them up if that's possible. Awesome. So listeners out there, check out Diversified Payments and uh, and get a hold of Crockett here if you have a business and are curious about how to save money. And for, for all you other listeners out there, be sure to check out the Wealthy Cowboy Show. It's all over YouTube. Uh, it's all over social media. And then uh, you run off of the the real Crockett Carruthers, I think it is, on, uh, on Instagram and stuff. I, I'm not sure that you run business through there. I'm just throwing that out there. But definitely yeah. check out the Wealthy Cowboy um terrific shows you put on a great production and you provide a lot of education for people that i'm sure identify with what your journey has been and and just the 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 success that you've had and that, that you inspire um it's terrific information out there so be sure to check this out yeah i appreciate it Awesome. Well, hey, Crockett, um, I can't thank you enough for your time. It was very cool. I uh, enjoyed the conversation. Um, as, as different topics come back up, we'll get you back on here. And uh, and Matthew Balderrama, thank you for uh, for going up and talking to people. I appreciate your efforts there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on, and 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 thanks, Matt, for uh, for coming and asking me. Likewise. This concludes episode number 101 for the National Land Realty Podcast, talking with Crockett Carruthers of the Wealthy Cowboy Podcast. Now remember, you can learn more about land ownership and the buying and selling of land at nationalland.com.